Lord, I would agree and uh, would pray that you would continue to comfort between them uh, as only you can. Uh, we are thankful that, uh, that Benjamin is alive and well and no longer uh, afflicted by cancer, no longer afflicted by downs, uh, and, and he's rejoicing. Uh, it's, it's us that are having a tough time, and so I pray that, uh, uh, that, that members of your body here would just be uh, your arms uh, around Edwina in the weeks and months to come. And we pray for faith as well. Um, she is such a prayer warrior, and uh, uh, she's, she's having a tough time, and I pray that you would heal her and, and let her know that we are praying for her. And uh, just open your word and through it, just very simply, encourage us to pray. And we just ask this in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Um, really, uh, this is the, the last week that we're going to be looking at, uh, at prayer, and, and really we could have looked, uh, at, we could have taken three weeks and looked at prayer from a whole lot of vantage points because it's just so important. Um, but I hope that this has encouraged you to, uh, uh, to just very simply grow, uh, grow in, in, in that time of prayer that each one of us have. And I think we've discovered that already that prayer is essential to our new life in Christ and our relationship with God. In fact, God invites us to pray. He draws us closer to him. He changes us as we spend time with him in prayer, and he answers prayer uh, for ourselves and for those that we pray for. And we saw last week that we can pray to God about anything, and we may not understand what's happening in our life. Uh, in fact, uh, Kurt put it this way last week. We may not understand what's happening in our life, but we can trust him and we can grow. And that trust grows. The more, we, the more time we spend in prayer, that trust in God grows. And when we face an impossible situation, and all of us do from time to time, we can pray to the God of wonders, the God of miracles, and he can make a way where no way exists. Now, tonight we're going to look at the role of prayer in spiritual warfare. Now, first we're going to have to look at what spiritual warfare is, and then we're going to look at two case studies that show uh, how God works through prayer uh, in these times of spiritual conflict. Now, first, what is spiritual warfare? In, in our kind of scientific and enlightened and skeptical culture, uh, any talk of such things might sound like fantasy. So we want to use what Scripture says to determine what it is and how to determine how to discern spiritual struggles around us. Actually, struggles between good and evil, there's references to them throughout the Bible. And one of the most straightforward is written by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, Paul is drawing on the sport of wrestling. That word for struggle means to wrestle. And wrestling was a really popular sport in Greece and Rome at that time. Uh, still is. And uh, he's saying that we oftentimes find ourselves engaged in a spiritual wrestling match with unseen but very real spiritual forces. So... Here might be a way to define spiritual warfare. It's a conflict between good and evil lived out in our lives and our world, but it often involves unseen struggle between angelic and demonic forces. Now, victory in this conflict 
was accomplished once and for all by Jesus Christ on the cross. That is absolutely important to, to remember. Whenever we're talking about spiritual warfare, the victory has already been accomplished by Jesus. But that victory is lived out struggle by struggle as we trust in him. Now, really, this conflict has been underway since before the world was created. God didn't initiate the conflict. It was initiated by a rebellion. Now, we've got to remember that Jesus is the creator of all things, including angels. There was a false belief at the time of the church. In fact, it still persists today that Jesus is an angel. Wrong. He's the creator of all things, including angels. In Colossians 1, it says... For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. So Jesus created angels prior to the creation of this world. You, you find that out in Job 38. And one of the highest angels created, his name was Lucifer, he chose to rebel. He decided that he could do a better job of being God than God can. That in fact, he, was, uh, he decided it's time to replace God with myself. And he actually drew one-third of all the angels uh, followed him in this rebellion. We find that out in both Isaiah 14 and Revelation 12. And these angels, these fallen angels, are the ones that the Apostle Paul is referring to when he's talking about the, the world forces of this darkness. We may call them by names like demons, evil spirits. Remember, they are fallen and defeated angels who work under the direction of Satan this chief fallen angel. So how do we recognize, you know, if, if, if these uh, spiritual forces of wickedness and good are usually unseen, how do we recognize if, if something's going on? Well, I think it's important that we, that we don't pay too much or too little attention to Satan. If we pay too much attention to him, we end up cowering, right? Right? We end up imagining a demon behind every bush, and, 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 we're, and we walk and live in fear, and he's won then. He has temporarily incapacitated us through fear and intimidation. You'll find out very soon that's one of his methods. It's very predictable. Now, if we pay too little attention to him, if we poo-poo the whole idea of uh, uh, angels and demons, he's free to engage and, and pull his tricks right under our noses and catch us unaware. So there needs to be a balance. And um, I think that balance is achieved by there's two, um, there's two gauges that are in Scripture, and they're means by which we can tell if there is spiritual warfare uh, going on. First is in Ephesians 6, 11, it talks about the devil's schemes. He's using his very predictable schemes. Uh, in, in Ephesians 6, 11, it says, put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And the word there means cunning tricks. In other words, his tricks may be subtle, but they're predictable. There's something we can know and recognize. And there are three, and, and, and search, search the Bible yourself to see if this is, this is a little more of a topical approach than we uh, normally take. In other words, we're going to be in uh, more than one spot in Scripture, but it shouldn't be too hard to follow. Um, there's, there's three really common tricks that Satan used. The biggest one is lies. He's called the father of lies. And, and deception, slander, false gods, false teaching about gods, all of that falls under that umbrella of lies. Fear is another one. Through threats or intimidation or sometimes that kind of, that, that fear you just can't put your finger on. That can be uh, spiritual in nature. And sin itself, 
Remember, we saw last week, God doesn't tempt us to sin. Well, Satan has no problem with that, right? And uh, it, it's that, that spiritual power behind sin. So he has schemes that he uses, and the other is that the devil's purposes are advocated. In, in 2 Corinthians 2, Paul says he's talking about forgiving one another. And he says, you need to forgive so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Now, it's a different Greek word there, and it means his thoughts or purposes. In other words, his purposes are fairly transparent. There are things that we can know, and so we can recognize that when, when they're being used. Now, in John chapter 10, Jesus gives us a thumbnail sketch of what Satan's purposes are. In, in John 10, Jesus is speaking to us as the good shepherd. And then he speaks of, of the devil as one who would come to steal sheep. So he refers to him as the thief. And in John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have a life and have it abundantly. And so let's take a real quick look at those, those three purposes of Satan. He, he wants to steal. Well, he can't steal our salvation, okay? He's lost that one. Because that is based not on what we've done, but what Jesus has done. But he can steal our peace, our sense of security, our fruitfulness. In other words, he can try and make a train wreck of our life. And how does he do that? Same methods. Lies, fear, sin. Okay? He, he, can, he can try and deceive. He can try and, and, and use slander. Uh, he can try to sow doubts or threats or, or uh, oppress you. Um, he can exploit the weaknesses of our flesh and add that extra level of intensity to those temptations. He tries to kill. He tries to end the lives of God's people. And through persecution, through, through things like addiction or despair, or, you know, I mean, the list goes on and on and on where his objective is to kill. And then finally, his objective is to destroy. He wants to destroy God's people, God's word, and God's work. Remember, Satan's objective is to obliterate God and replace him with himself. Now, he'll never succeed because he has been defeated once and for all by Jesus Christ. And it's so important to remember that. And we don't want to forget the end of that verse in John 10.10. 10. Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. And part of that means we're alert to the purposes and methods employed by Satan. And we have victory over them in his strength. And we may experience spiritual conflict. We may also, without even knowing it, experience God's deliverance and intervention. Angels who do God's bidding are often sent by him to intervene on our behalf, and we may be unaware of their presence. And God intervenes in response to prayer. And so what role does prayer play in spiritual warfare? A really big one. In fact, if you look at the, the armor that's given us to withstand against those schemes of the devil, most of it is defensive. Prayer is an offensive weapon. It's, it's a way that we can intervene on behalf of ourselves and other people. In fact, that's what it says in Ephesians 6, 18. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. So we're to pray and be alert. Be alert to uh, uh, the struggles that are, other people are experiencing. So in order to better understand what prayer looks like, in spiritual warfare, we're going to take a brief look at two, uh, we'll call them case studies, 
uh, one from the Old Testament, one from the New. Now, uh, we're not going to read the whole passage for purposes of time. I'll, I'll paraphrase it, but we'll look at how prayer has been used in, in each of these encounters. The first one is in 2 Kings chapter 6. We're going to start at verse 8, but I'll be kind of skipping around there. You can, probably, you can follow along with me. Now, this is the story of Elisha and the king of Syria. Elisha was a prophet sent to the, the nation of Israel, and this took place during the reign of King Jehoram. Now, he was, um, he was a lousy king. He was the son of King Ahab, who was terrible, and Jehoram wasn't much better. And Samaria was the, the capital of Israel at the time. And Elisha lived in a little village called Dothan. And he had a servant who stayed with him. He was probably a young man that he was discipling. At that same time, the king of Syria was at war with Israel. And he was making plans, you know, and he'd, and he'd assemble his council and he'd tell them, you know what, we're going to move our camp to such and such a place so we can attack Israel. Israel. Well, God revealed that to Elisha, who then told King Jehoram. And so whenever the, the king of Syria moved his camp, there wasn't anybody there to fight. And this happened more than once. And so he assembled his council again, and he said, all right, who's the spy here? Who, who's spying for Israel? And uh, this is what his, his council told him in 2 Kings 6, beginning at verse 12. One of his servants said, No, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and take him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. He sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Now this makes sense. Rather than recognizing the power of God at work, uh, the king of Syria uh, made, made a, a great decision. Let's destroy the messenger instead of paying attention to the message. Now, we don't know for certain whether spiritual forces of wickedness were exploiting the king of Syria's situation, but it's safe to assume they were based on God's response here. So the next morning, Elijah's servant got up and uh, went to fix the coffin. He looks outside, and, and, and he sees a terrifying sight. The army of Syria surrounded the whole little village. And since the servant knew what Elisha had been doing, he knew why that army was there. And he demonstrates what might be our first response to panic in verses 15 and 16. Now, when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And the servant said to him, Oh, ass, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And I'm sure the servant looked at Elisha and said, What are you talking about? There's nobody else there. And in verse 17, then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now, since Elisha was already aware of these angels that were present, it's obvious that he was in prayer about this situation. And God chose to reveal uh, to Elisha the answer to both comfort and encourage him. And you know, God can comfort us through prayer by giving us little glimpses of what he's doing on our behalf. We really need those at time. Notice, this situation is very similar to the one that Asaph faced last week. It is absolutely impossible. There is no way out of it. And the, the Syrian army was there to apprehend Elisha and likely kill him. There was nothing anybody could do except God. And God's answer was to dispatch these horses and chariots of fire. And so we may not be aware of, of the times when God has 
intervene like that. Uh, but it happens nonetheless. Now, here's a quote by a commentator that I think is really important to think about. He said, faith is never the imagining of unreal things. Faith is never the imagining of unreal things. You know, that would be called delusion. And it would be horribly deceptive if Scripture and then those who teach it encouraged people to believe a delusion. Rather, faith is the grip of things which cannot de be demonstrated to the senses, but which are real. The chariots of, and horses of fire were actually there, even though they couldn't be seen. Now, a lot of times, if we're in a, uh, a difficult situation, the situation is constantly changing. And so prayer should be ongoing. And even, even though both Elisha and his servant knew that God had their back, here comes the Syrian army down the hill toward them. And so they kept praying. And as they prayed, God revealed his solution. And it was one that no one would have thought of. Remember last week, like before the Red Sea, we, we see a similar situation here. In verse 18, when they came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people with blindness, I pray. So God struck them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. Here's this powerful army now rendered helpless. And again, Elisha, being guided by the Lord, he offers to lead the army to the man they were seeking. Well, they didn't know his voice, and so they didn't realize he was the one that was speaking to them. Now, technically, he was there, but he still led him to a place where Elisha was going to be. Well, he led him right into the middle of Samaria, right to Jehoram the king, and this tiger that was sent to attack Israel was rendered toothless. And so again, as, as we pray, we can even ask God, what should I pray for? I doubt Eli Elisha didn't come up with this plan. God gave it to him. And you can ask, especially in, in a matter of spiritual conflict, Lord, Lord, how do I pray here? And God will show us. And, and so in verse 20, when they'd come into Samaria, Elisha said, O oh Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. Surprise! And, uh, you know, this is another trait of God's work. In matters of spiritual warfare, he often injects humor at the devil's expense. I think being evil is a pretty, you know, uh, humorless business. And Satan, you know, he imagines himself to be God, you know, and so uh, having all that arrogance all the time, being completely full of yourself, that, that, that uh, gets pretty insufferable. Now, as he is defeated in conflict after conflict, God doesn't indulge Satan's arrogance, and humor often arises as a result of God's intervention, which I am sure infuriates our enemy. And King Jehoram, he's, he's looking at this, you know, and, and, and he's going, oh man, this is like catching fish in a barrel. And, and he thinks, should I, should I kill them all? Well, God hasn't intervened for that to happen. And Elisha says, treat these men like you would POWs, like you would want our captured men to be treated. And so instead of anybody fighting, they all sat down to a great meal. And, and then Jehoram sent the Syrian army home unharmed. And so what a solution, a solution only God would have thought of. All saw his power, all experienced God's mercy, everyone's life was spared, and the raiding from Syria stopped. So let's, let's think a moment about what we can take away from this, this case study, as it were. When we're in danger, God intervenes on our behalf in response to prayer. When there's no way out, God can provide that way also in response to prayer. In fact, God can even guide us in how we should pray when we have no clue. 
Another powerful example of prayer in the midst of spiritual conflict occurs in the early history of the church. And now I'd like you to skip over to Acts chapter 12. Now, the reason in this passage for spiritual opposition was growth. The church was on fire and growing. In fact, Peter had just been, it had just been revealed to him that, that the gospel was for not just the Jews, but the Gentiles. And he reported to the church in Jerusalem, wow, this is what happened. And, and the, the church in Antioch was taking care of poor uh, believers in Jerusalem. And so the church was growing and the gospel was spreading. And in verse 1 of Acts chapter 12, we, we hear of Herod Agrippa I. This was a 30-something-year-old king. He had a, a really checkered history. He, he was in and out of debt, in and out of prison. Uh, he was an opportunist, okay? And, and things were going his way at this particular moment. And he came from a really wicked family, in fact, his grandfather, Herod the Great, that was the man who ordered all of the, the children in Bethlehem, ages two and under, to be executed in a vain effort to kill the infant Jesus. That's his, that's his heritage, right? And so he ordered, in, in verse 2, he ordered the apostle James to be executed. That's Peter, James, and John the members of, of Jesus' inner circle. And that certainly shook up the church. There's nobody immune now. See, they were growing, and now, and now, this, whoa, this is, this is serious. And again, he, he was a self-serving politician. Most of the people in his, uh, in his kingdom were unbelieving Jews, and they kind of liked that. Yeah, get them. And uh, since that made them happy, he went ahead and arrested the apostle Peter as well. He arrested him before Passover, and then he thought, all right, I'll execute him, but I'll wait till after Passover. One commentator thought that he wanted to risk a riot, because remember, almost a million people came to Jerusalem during Passover, didn't want a riot. It, he wanted it to look like he respected Jewish holidays, and he wanted to get full credit, full political capital for doing this. And so Herod assigned four fours, is what it says, four groups of four soldiers in order to keep the apostle Peter in jail. And, and he no doubt had heard about the time in Acts 5 where the apostle Peter had been released by an angel and he's preaching in the temple, and they went and they found the, the prison locked and the guards still in place. And so he wanted to make really sure Peter stayed put. Now, normally a single guard was at the prison door. Extra security was a guard at the door and one manacled to the prisoner. There's two guards at the door, two guards locked to Simon Peter. So he was under 24-hour maximum security. These guys changed shift every six hours, so they, they had fresh guys. Maximum surveillance. And in verse 5, while Peter was being closely guarded in the prison, there was fervent prayer going up to God by the church. And this is a crisis if God didn't intervene, and he was the only one who could intervene, Peter would be dead in the morning because this was the night before he was going to be executed. And the church was united. They were praying as one. Uh, they were praying because they loved Peter, and they were also engaging into this spiritual struggle. You could just see it uh, in, in this Situation: You've got Herod, who's the self-serving politician, and, and so he just wants to get uh, a little more praise. But behind that, you have Satan trying to wipe out the church in its infancy by destroying its key leadership. And so here they are praying, and prayer is an offensive weapon in spiritual conflict. 
Think of how many similar, similar situations exist today where only God can act, but the church can pray. Think of that. Only God can act, but the church can pray. Think of believers in North Korea. Did you realize that North Korea, prior to World War II, was called the Jerusalem of the East? Pyongyang? Believers have been almost obliterated by the, the reign of the Kims. Think of believers in Muslim countries, uh, people facing just crises in their life. Uh, think of Dave and Laura Manser and their daughter, Annika, where we, any situation where we are powerless to intervene, we can pray. And God answers. And God did answer. An angel appeared in the cell there with Peter. And in fact, he had to give Peter a sharp poke in the side. That's what it literally says. And obviously, Peter had been praying himself because here he is. He's, he's about, he's going to be executed in the morning. He's sound asleep. So obviously, God had taken the worry about that off his shoulder. And as Peter stirred, the chains fell off his wrist. And, and so the angel said, get up, get dressed, tie your sandals on. And they, you know, they left, but they're not in a panic. And Peter thought he was dreaming because they, they walked through two levels of lockdown. And then they walked to the iron gate of the prison. And that, that just opened by itself. And then they ended up out on a street. And then the angel disappeared. By that time, he was awake, and he realized he wasn't dreaming. In Acts 12, 11, it says, when Peter came to himself, he said, now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and all that the Jewish people were expecting. Now, when we pray, we shouldn't be surprised that God answers. Sometimes we are. That's what happened with, with the folks who were praying here. Once Peter realized he was free, he ran to the house of the mother of John Mark, the guy who wrote the gospel of Mark. And he started knocking on the door because that was one of the house churches. And people were inside praying for him at that very moment. And a servant girl named Rhoda answered the door. She acted as a lookout as well, and she would warn the people inside if danger existed. And she must have known Peter well because she recognized his voice, and she was so excited that she ran back in to tell everybody, but she left him at the door. And in verse 15, it's, this is the response. These people that have been praying, pouring their hearts out to God, they said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. They kept saying, it is his angel. Now, if, if the situation wasn't so serious, this would make a great script for a comedy, you know? Rhoda comes in, comes in and says, Peter's outside. They say, you're nuts. You're crazy. And, and she kept insisting. And then they said, they came up with an alternate explanation. They said that the word means either it's his guardian angel, and they thought that guardian angels looked like the person, or they said it's his ghost. He's departed. They've murdered him already, and his spirit is now coming to warn us. And meanwhile, Peter's outside knocking. You know, he might have looked over his shoulder every once in a while to see if he's being pursued yet. In verse 16, Peter continued knocking, and when they'd opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. God had answered their prayer in real time, and they, they weren't expecting that. But remember, they and we are praying to the God of wonders, to the God of miracles. And we're also praying to our God who has a sense of humor. Now, even, they, even though they were still in danger, their own behavior, I'm sure, brought a smile to their faces, uh, at least later on. And then in verse 17, there is the most understated verse in the Bible. Now, when day came, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as to what could have become of Peter. Can you imagine the cursing and swearing and blaming that went on there? And, and truly, none of the guards knew what had happened. And so here, many times, God provides 
a solution that no one could have thought of as we pray and as we ask him. You see, if we try and figure it out ourselves, he'll let us. But if we ask him to intervene, he will often come up with a plan no one else could have come up with. You see, Herod had this great plan, foolproof. Execute the apostle Peter, gain more favor. Satan, no doubt, was hard at work behind that. And he wanted to destroy the church. Instead, God provides a solution that turns the whole situation upside down. Peter is released by an angel. Herod questions these guards. They have no clue. He has them all executed. And then, not long after that, Herod himself is struck down by God and dies. And so in a short time, those who had all the power and were oppressing were instead gone. And the ones they were, who were being oppressed and who followed Jesus were free. And the greatest victory of all is at the end of the chapter, but the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. So what could we take away from these two uh, case histories uh, as far as prayer in spiritual conflict? First, we always face a foe that hates us because we hate, because we love Jesus. And we are no match for Satan in our own strength. Don't ever think you are. He's way smarter and more powerful than any of us. But Jesus will defeat him every time, in every conflict, as we depend on him. And prayer with alertness and perseverance, fervent prayer for those in the midst of conflict is an offensive weapon in spiritual warfare. It makes a difference because the struggle is real and God answers prayer. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for these great examples that encourage us so much to pray. Um, we thank you that you have given us kind of objective criteria for identifying um, spiritual warfare. We're so thankful that because of your victory, we don't need to go around kind of looking over our shoulder and uh, imagining um, and fearing, but we can rest in the victory that you have provided through our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, um, just guide us in a very practical way. Help us to be alert to people who are in the midst of a spiritual wrestling match and help us to intercede for them through prayer. Thank you for your word and uh, thank you for the time with, uh, with Jeff the time to worship, and we are dismissed in the powerful name of the victor over sin and Satan, our Lord Jesus. Amen.